welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA A plus certification training course on cable types. I'm James Messer, and I'll be your host for this module where we're going to talk about the requirements from CompTIA course 220-601. That test in section 1.1 requires that we understand the names, purposes, and characteristics of ports and of cables. So we're going to talk about what different cable types are. We're going to look at how we use certain conventions to understand how cables work. And we're going to look at some standard cables and how they operate in your computers today. Let's talk a little bit about cable types. So I've got a few listed out on the screen here. The one on the far left is a ribbon cable. And it's called a ribbon cable because it's flat and it's thin, just like a ribbon might be. Each one of these little bumps in the cable is a pin. And so we've got a lot of different pins going down this ribbon cable. This is often used inside of personal computers to connect hard drives and connect floppy drives. These days, we've changed from a ribbon cable connection into more of a thinner SATA type cable. But this ribbon cable, you'll still see it very often in a lot of systems since it's been around for so long. Another cable type is a coaxial cable or a coax cable. This coax cable consists of this very small piece of copper that's in the middle of the cable. And it's usually wrapped in a dielectric and usually has some shielding around it. So it's very strong. And you can see that it can wrap around corners. You see it used in cable television, for instance, in the ground outside because it's very sturdy and very durable. Another type of cable is the twisted pair cable. Twisted pair cables are very often used in networking. And you can see the cables themselves are all twisted around each other and then wrapped in a separate piece of covering on the outside. And they're twisted because in that way, it minimizes the amount of interference from the cables with each other. So they're wrapped in these little tight little bundles within the cable. So it's perfect for networking. There's not a lot of shielding here, almost no shielding, except for a little bit of plastic around it, which doesn't stop any of the signals going in and out. So it's very light and it's very durable, but you want to be sure that it's not used in an area like uh, that you're putting over a fluorescent light, for instance, because there's nothing to stop the interference from that light from getting into the cable itself. So networking cables, you'll very much see these twisted pair wires all the time. What I did was just strip off the end of an Ethernet cable so you could see what was inside of that. Some of the newer types of cables you'll see, especially in a data center, are these fiber optic cables. And these days, they're even pulling fiber optic cables all the way to your house with certain cable systems because you can put a lot of information over a piece of fiber. What this is, instead of having copper in the middle of it, has a very small fiber around the middle of it. It's wrapped in some protective coating so that it doesn't break that fiber. Fiber is very delicate. And what we do is send light from this side, and we send it through the fiber. There's very little loss. So on the other end, we can go a very long distance. And on the other end, we can see the light coming out the other side and use that as a method of communication. We can send a massive amount of information through these. So this will allow you to send a lot of information over a long distance. Very expensive to be able to do that, to be able to send light that way. But it's a very capable way of doing it, especially when you want to send voice, video, and a lot of different types of data through a single connection all at the same time. When we start working with cables, there are certain conventions that we use, certain terms that we use. We almost do it without thinking about it these days, but it would be nice to go back and look at what we mean by some of that. For instance, we'll often describe a cable as having a male connection and a female connection. And although it may be obvious which one is which, you can start to see here the pins that are sticking out on a connector. Whenever you see the pins, that's a male connection. And whenever you see a place where the pins would go, that's a female connection. Very common convention, one we're humanizing some of the things that we use within our computer systems. But when I say I need a 25 pin male connection, then I'm talking about this type of connector right here. So it makes it very easy when you're describing it, you're writing it down, or you're telling somebody what you need. They can really see exactly what you're describing and what you're talking about when you work with those male or those female type connectors. Another convention we'll use is we want to be sure when we're plugging cables in that the pin 1 plugs into pin 1. Every single connector you see, the pins are numbered. And so you want to plug them in the same way. This connector looks almost exactly the same on either side. So looking at this ribbon cable, how would I know which side is pin 1? Well, you can start to see, especially on ribbon cables, there's this red color that extends along the side. And I know, aha, uh -huh, that's where pin 1 is. So if you've ever looked at a ribbon cable and you wonder, why is there a color at the end of this? That's to signify which end of that cable is pin 1. And if you look at a motherboard or a device where you're plugging into, it will usually have a 1 connected to it on the end written on that particular connection. So you know exactly where that colored cable is supposed to plug into. 
Another way to make sure you plug into exactly where you want to go is something called missing pins and keys. And this is a connection from an IDE port on my motherboard. And you can see that it has all these pins here, except whoop, there's no pin right there. There's a pin missing. I wonder why that is. Let me back up one slide so you start to see. Look at how you have all these open connections. And look at how that particular connector is filled in. That way I could plug into this cable connection and I know that when I plug this in and it goes in that it's in the right place because it's not going to plug in any other way. Now there's also on this connection a key. If I'm plugging in with a cable that happens to have on it a little bump, I know that I can't turn it the wrong way to plug this in because the key would not fit into that hole that's there. So it's another way when it's dark, you're plugging into the motherboard, it's maybe up under the power supply, it's very cramped space, and you're feeling around just to see where it is, it's a good way to double check and make sure that when you plug it in, it's actually plugged in exactly the way it should be. There's a set of very standard cables that we talk about in our industry, so I thought it'd be nice to go through a few of those. One that's very common is a USB cable. It's used for almost everything these days, for printers, for hard drives, for scanners, for my mobile phone has a USB connection on it. And so you'll see that the USB cables have become very ubiquitous. They're almost everywhere. And it makes sense that you'd have USB. It's a very common and it's a very easy way to plug into the devices. You only need one type of connection on a computer, on a laptop, and you're able to plug into a whole slew of different types of devices. We also are expecting this to change. There'll be another USB standard, and a lot of things are using FireWire as another type of standard. So you'll see, in fact, on my laptop, I have both a USB connection and a FireWire connection. Very common today to see both of those all uh, really fighting over where, what should plug into where and how that standard's going to play out. We also see a number of parallel connections. You see this on older systems, usually a 25 pin connection, most often used for printers. Most of the new printers these days are connected via USB. So you don't see much parallel connectors anymore. But if you're working in an older system or you have an older printer that you'd like to use, very often it has that 25 pin connection or that big funny looking Centronix connection on the back of the printer. Another standard cable is a serial cable. Again, it's one that's not seen on newer computers, but it's been used through the years to plug in modems, to plug in mice, to plug in printers. And so it could really, it is a multiple use. You can start to see this is the old school of the USB. The serial port almost ran a lot of different things back in the day. And today you still have serial ports. It's really important because some of the networking equipment that you have in the core of your computer systems, the routers, the switches, the firewalls, will often use these very common serial connections to configure them. And so uh, if you have a newer piece of hardware, you have a newer laptop, the newer laptop's not going to have this serial port on the back of it. But there are these uh, adapters that will take a USB connection and output a serial port. So I happen to have one of those on my laptop. So I can still plug into a firewall and configure it, even though I don't have this actual serial connection on the back of my laptop. There's another type of serial cable that's called a null modem connection. A null modem cable is usually what's used to connect directly to the serial port on another device. Now, what normally happens, you would plug into a modem. That modem goes to the other end, and that modem then remodulates it back into a digital signal you can understand on the other side. But if you're plugging into a device that's directly in front of you, you have to have something that acts like a modem. And what it really does is swap some pins so that the transmitted pin goes into the receive pin on the other side and vice versa. The problem with this is that a null modem cable, which is the blue one, looks exactly like a serial cable, which is this one that's the white colored one. So you're never quite certain unless it's actually written on the cable or you've assigned a tag to it that says, this is a null modem cable. So if you have a cable like this, you may want to be sure that you mark them or you're writing on them that you've specified this is a null modem connection. Otherwise, it's not going to work when you plug it in directly. In Ethernet networking, there's something called a crossover cable. And it's not exactly what you might think based on the name. A crossover cable is used when you want to plug in directly from one Ethernet device to another. Normally, you go into an Ethernet hub or an Ethernet switch to be able to do this. And whenever you look at a standard Ethernet cable, it is a cable that's what we call straight through. Pin 1 goes to pin 1, pin 8 goes to pin 8, and everything in between is directly connected to each other. And if you were to hold those up to each other, you'd see the pin colors on both sides were exactly the same. A crossover cable actually crosses the signal over. Pin 1 goes to pin 3, pin 3 goes to pin 1, pin 2 goes to pin 6, 
pin six goes to pin two, you can start to see where things are crossing over. It's not a direct crossover. One doesn't go to eight and eight doesn't go to one. It's a little bit different than that. It's based on the Ethernet specification. So when you start to see these crossover cables, they're usually marked crossover. Maybe they're a different color. Make sure you tag these as crossover. And fortunately, the end of these cables is clear. So you could hold the cable up to it and start to see what pin goes to what pin. You don't have to do a lot of testing like you had to do with the null modem cables to know exactly what type of crossover cable or straight through cable you happen to have. In review, we've looked at different cable types. We now know what a ribbon cable versus a coax cable is. We understand now some of the conventions that are in place with our pin one and being able to understand how the cables are keyed and why they're keyed that way. And we've looked at some very standard cables that you're most likely to run into when you're working in some of your environments today. For more videos on cables, if you'd like to comment on this video or participate in some of our message boards, you can always visit our website, freeaplus.com.